All right, hello and welcome back. This is uh, gonna be one of my favorite lectures because I have a lot of fun examples for this topic. It is fun to do it. So uh, we ended here last time and I added some more words. Uh, sorry for this wall of text, but I'm trying to teach you the theory behind why the easy thing that I'm about to show you works. Okay, so uh, the key idea for all this stuff that I was saying before, the fact that IFS can be treated like a Boolean value, can use it as the condition of something, uh, what it means when it's a Boolean value, it means that it's okay, you can still read from it. Uh, this entire expression, the last key thing, if you say IFS, please read for me something from IFS, that actually evaluates to IFS itself. Let me prove that to you. And again, this is more words, I'm gonna show you an example, don't worry. You say operator, input, it does something, it gets you a, a something, it returns itself, which means that's as if you said if IFS and you just tried to read something. So this will tell you if the read operation that you just tried to do succeeded, if this evaluates to true. If so, you can do stuff with that S that you just read into. So you should say while IFS reads something, could be a line, say ifs.getLine, you can say ifs read some integer, read s, read a word. Use this to read valid lines of an if stream object, of a file. Okay, so I'm gonna give you examples of this, don't worry. Uh, this is all gonna be okay. So uh, the next thing that I wanna do is, uh, before we get there, before I give you that example, I want to uh, give you a nice way of thinking about IF streams. You can pretend that they're like Microsoft Word, or Google Docs, whatever you, just, whatever you use to write essays, like even PowerPoint. There's that little cursor that's going to tell me where, if I start typing, it's going to go. So IF streams essentially use cursors. So this starts the cursor at the beginning of the file. So right after this line, I say, hey, please open this file. It's going to tell me, okay, yeah, I did it. My cursor's sitting here, and that's where I'm going to start reading from. Okay? And so that's why you can keep saying, IFS, get a new thing, get a new thing, and it gets something different because it has moved its cursor. Okay? This reads a line and moves the cursor. It reads a, reads a word. Okay? So if I say, uh, with my cursor sitting here, if I say IFS, hey, read a line for me, or read a string, it will move the cursor to having uh, appeared after that string, okay? So it's gonna have moved it, and now it's, reading, it's waiting to read the rest of the file down here. Okay, it's sitting right here, this is where its cursor lies, okay? And so then uh, you say it one more time, it's gonna read, starting right here, it's gonna eat up the new line, and then read this word and move the cursor to sit right here. Okay, so it just read bar the second time. And then it's gonna read baz in the same way and the blah comes after, okay? So it's always gonna advance its little cursor. If it was here, it's gonna then read this word and move it to be here so that it's ready to read the next one. Move it to be here now that it's done. Okay, so after those four lines, it's sitting here. And really, there's a special thing at the end of the file and I've told you, it's called EOF, end of file. So uh, you actually have to read, you have to try to read one more time to notice that you're at the end of the file, okay? That is all. Uh, so let me give you that example. Let me show you accidentally reading after the file is over. So uh, if I did this right, I want to copy this to here and I'm gonna call it, uh, I don't know, cursors, cursor.cpp or something. And then I also want to copy uh, a sample file that I made here, and I'm going to call it whatever I set up here, simple-file.txt. OK, so I have many things, but I had this cursor.cpp program. And what it holds is essentially all this stuff. I'm going to comment out this last one, uh, this last three lines. So it's going to keep getting, uh, keep getting a string 
from IFS. That's what this program does. Keeps getting words from IFS. Okay. So it reads a word, prints it out, and prints out whether or not it found the end of the file. Okay. So uh, let me show you this output uh, working. Oops. And cursor.cvp, cursor. So I'm going to give it uh, sample. What was it called? Simple file.txt. So it's going to read those four words, move its cursor, and it's going to say that it hasn't found the end of the file, even after the fourth read. OK? This is the file. Uh, foobar baz blah. Just as, as it was. So the reason it hasn't found the end of the file yet is because the cursor is sitting right here at the end still. OK? You need one extra read. So uh, here it is. I'm going to try and read one more word that doesn't exist. OK? And so it's going to say what it read, and then it's going to say if it found EOF. So notice that if you read past the end of the file, it will flip the EOF bit, we say. Uh, so it's finally true. It noticed that it read the end of the file. And if you were to say, uh, if you were to say this, IFS is actually false now as well. Uh, that's what it means. If it found something that it couldn't read after, found the end of the file. So IFS is now false. It was true before. You get a copy of the previous word. OK? When you try to read, and you read past the end of the file, your variable doesn't get reset. So you get a copy of the previous line, because it's still sitting in there. It didn't get changed or anything to get set to null or empty string or something like that. So you need to be very, very careful. About accidentally using your input variable. when you read uh, close to the end of the file. Past the end of the file. OK, that's all I want to tell you. Uh, if you try to read once more, it won't do anything to s. It'll keep it what it was, but it will also say that, oh, yes, we found the end of the file now. So you got to check that before you use that s that you thought was new. OK. Uh, and then an easy way to make sure it's always OK is to put it in the condition right here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you an example of that in a fun way. So uh, if you've ever been to IKEA, you notice that all of their product names are just random words kind of stitched together. They're random Swedish words. And uh, I couldn't find a list of Swedish nouns or adjectives, so uh, bear with me. I'm going to include a few verbs and random articles and things. But here's the list of... Uh, A thousand of the most common Swedish words. Okay, so we're gonna find two random ones. We're gonna read this file and get two random Swedish words, and uh, we're gonna stitch them together, and that'll be our new IKEA product, the new hot IKEA product of the of the year. I think I should get rid of all the things with spaces in them, though. Oop.
and all right, no more spaces, cool. Okay, so the idea is we're going to uh, read all the IKEA products, or read all the Swedish words into a vector of strings by reading the file. And then we'll pick two random ones. And that'll be our new IKEA product. Okay. So we'll say vim uh, IKEA.cpp, I guess. And all right, so. F stream string. Here's how we're going to do it. We're going to take the name of the file as the first parameter. So we'll say ifs, or if stream ifs, ifs.open, argv of one, hoping that the user gave us one. And then we're going to start reading. Read every word in the file to a vector of strings. So vector string Swedish words. And I need vector as well now. Oops. Okay, so we're gonna read every word in the file, and I've told you that this is gonna work while IFS get a new string s. This will always read a valid line, okay? Because IFS s, this whole thing, if I put it in quotes, it always wants to double them. This evaluates to, uh, well, it first gets a string, and then evaluates to IFS, so it's as if we were checking whether or not it was true. And if it's true, we didn't read past the end of the file. Therefore, we have a valid line once we hit the body. It's a long string of reasoning to get to this idea, but it's going to save your life. It's very useful to just put reading inside the condition of a loop. Okay, so we're going to get a new, uh, we now have a string, new word, s, so we'll put it in v, or Swedish words vector. And so now we have all our stuff, we're done with the file, so we'll say ifs.close. And now we'll find two random, get two random words. And so one way to do that is to use randomness. So we'll say, c std lib, uh, c time, seed the random number generator, and then get two random sweetest words. So string s1 equals, I guess, who knows, switch words dot at go into the vector somewhere, some valid index into the vector, which is, well, it's some random number modded by the size of the vector. Okay, because this will always give you a valid index mod by Swedish words that size because the result of this will be between zero and the size minus one which is always going to be a valid index. Beautiful. Something that's not empty. And we'll do the same for s2 and then we'll just plop them together. Maybe we should capitalize s1. Uh, there. Product name at zero equals uh, two upper s1. And we need cc type for that, right? Or 
sorry, to upper, I guess we could just use product name of zero. So capitalize it because it's a proper noun. And we'll print it out. Okay, so uh, let's compile this and let's uh, let's run it. Or actually, just in case you've never seen IKEA products before, I'm gonna go take a screenshot of one of them so you can see the the cool, silly stuff. Okay, here are some examples. They are just seemingly random words. Uh, like this one means good morning. So that's what we're gonna come up with for our product names. All right, so let's run it now. And remember, we have to give it the name of the file that we want to use. So we've got to give it Swedish words.txt. Technically, it's just getting two things, uh, two strings, capitalizing one. And all right, so I have IKEA the program. I have Swedish words.txt. Let us run this and come up with an IKEA product name by picking two random ones. So we read the entire file, a vector of all the words, put them into a vector, and then we pick two random ones. Okay, so this is a valid example of reading from files. All right, so there is our new product name. That honestly sounds like it could be from IKEA, right? And you can just keep on trying these until. Uh, you find one that looks like uh, something that you can market. Okay. That's fun. Uh, the next fun thing that I want to do is translation. So let's read our favorite song's lyrics and translate some of the words. This is another example of reading from a file. Again, words at a time. Uh, you can also do line by line if you wanted to. Uh, let's see here. And that's the idea. So I've I've made uh, or I've copied into uh, Let It Go Lyrics.txt the lyrics for Let It Go. And here they are. Let us read all of those and then translate some of them. Okay. So again, uh, we'll use most of these, uh, most of these things, I think. Don't think we need randomness anymore. Don't need a vector, but we want to read a word at a time. So we want to say, uh, something like, we don't want to output S again, we just read a We don't want to output S, we want to output the translated version of S. So we'll say, uh, see out S, and then let's just do a space for now. But not S, but translate S. And here's my translate function. It gives back a string. And it takes a string. I guess we can be fancy. We can take it by constant reference because we're not changing it. Uh, and right now, let's just pretend we don't know how to translate anything. And we'll just say return s. So right now, we have a very bad translation program. So let's let's run this now. Uh, Oh, I have 
have to give it a name of a file, of course. Uh, let's make it so that I never forget. There. Now if I do it wrong again, it will complain. There. So let's run it with uh, let it go lyrics txt and it's just reading every word and spitting it right back out to us so uh, we want to translate some of these words and this would be the fun time in class where I'd ask you what languages you speak so that we could put some pieces of you in this program uh, but sadly we are not together so I'm just gonna pick some words in some languages and we're gonna have we're just gonna roll with that so uh, it's always gonna be from English And then we're going to translate to some other language. So let's look at these. How about snow? We can translate that to another language. Uh, if you know Spanish, snow is nieve. So we know how to translate one word now. So if it's one of the words we know how to translate, if s is equal to, oops, oh no. How am I going to do this? If s is equal to, how did it paste? There we go. Nieve, we're going to return. Oh, sorry. I'm going to return Nieve if s is equal to snow. Excuse me. And I've just been getting used to typing ifs too much. There we go. So now else. Uh, we didn't get there. We, we had nothing else to do. Return s. So now it says the nieve glows white on the mountain tonight. All right. Let's. Uh, how about we? Nouns are easy. Let's translate white to another language. Uh, how about? I don't know. A non-romance language. How about German? Vice. I don't know if it's capitalized. If it's, I think it's, we want the adjective form, right? It might be lowercase. I'm really not sure. I don't know German that well. Else, if s is equal to white, return vice. And I think it's with a w, I would assume. That is lowercase. So now, again, the nieve glows vice on the mountain tonight. Let's do one more for good measure. And how about like uh, Chinese or something? Chinese or Japanese, whichever one, because if we do mountain, it's the same character. It's either Yama or it is. Well, either one, I guess. Shan. So, same character. It's mountain. Return Shun or Yama. Beautiful. And we can work our way through this as far as we want. Uh, the other thing that's not so pretty right now is this lyrics file. I mean, it has like choruses, it has verses, it has stuff in between. It's got new lines in special places, it's got breakings of lines. We're just outputting spaces. That's no fun. Let's fix that. We're gonna have to worry about reading white space now. Okay? So, and the way we do that is through features of IF streams. So instead of reading, let's get. Let's get a single character, okay? Let's peek and get, okay? So if you say ifstream.peek, it will give you the next character. For weird C reasons, it gives you an int instead of a char, but who cares? Pretend it's a char. 
and also uh, git actually gets the character. So we can look at the next character and then also get it, it. Okay. So let's worry about if it's a space or not. So now let's uh, preserve the white space. You got your spaces, you got your new lines, things like that. Let's preserve those. Let's just not translate everything into spaces. That's silly. So uh, while is space ifs dot peak. Well, the next thing in the file is a space. Print that same thing out. See out ifs dot peak. Uh, and then also eat up that space. Advance the cursor. Let's say ifs.git. I guess technically we could we could put it there as well. Advance the cursor and output that space character. Because if you can see my cursor right now, peak sees like I'm right here on uh, char. If I go after char. The next character is a space. If you can see me moving that. Uh, and if I peek it, I haven't moved the cursor. But when I get it, I get the space and move the cursor. OK, that's the idea for that. And uh, we don't also want to read past the end of the file. So while IFS is true and we can look ahead, uh, do all this stuff. And that should be that. And it doesn't want me to put another brace anywhere else. OK. Uh, that should do it, I think. That should preserve the spaces. Assuming I re recompile this, I have to press up too many times. Oh, hello. And this looks weird because I'm outputting ifs.git, which returns an int for no good reason. It's supposed to be a char, dude. Interpret it as a char, please. And then I don't want a new line. That was an accident. Much better. So instead of 32, hey man, that was a space or a new line, whichever one of those it was. OK. So now the nieve glows vice on the shun or yama tonight on a footprint to be seen. Beautiful. And we've got the new lines. We've got everything. It's all beautiful. We're not reading past the end of the file ever. That's a good example, I hope. Hope that was fun. Now, my last example for this little subtopic is let's program the cp command to read a file one character at a time and output it to another file. So usually you say cp file1 into file2. It copies file1 and calls it file2. which is fun. Uh, let's use one if stream and one of stream to do the same thing. OK, so I want to be able to say my copy dot slash copy or something, file one, file two. And then it's going to copy the file. OK, so then uh, let's add it cp dot t or dot cpp. There we go. So again, uh, we're going to do a lot of the same stuff. So maybe I should try and include a lot of this boilerplate. There we are. Don't need randomness. Do need an IF stream. Uh, I also need an OF stream. So. So argv1 is the name of the file we want to copy uh, for input to read it, and then open the file we want to copy to, copy into, for output. We're going to write to it. OK, so uh, let's do it a character at a time, 
and that's going to require using git. So git a character from an ice stream. And how do you write just a single character? Well, technically, you can use the output operator, but there's another way for OF streams. You can either use the output operator, or you can use put to put a single character. Oops. <laughs> That's funny. To write a single character. Okay. So, uh, while ifs dot git or ifs dot well, well we can read from ifs I guess and uh, yeah while well, that's true while well, we can read from it while well, it's still okay uh, actually none of these will work in this case we have to use an infinite loop we have to try to read char c equals ifs dot git and it might have not worked so if not ifs break out of the loop And now we can do our work. Now we say ofs.put c, and we just do that as long as we can. Okay, then we're finally done with both files. And we can return. So we open a file for reading and a file for writing. We get a file from the reading file, as long as we, or get a character from the reading file as long as we can. And then we write that to the output. Okay, hopefully that's not too bad. Just a few different examples of files just practicing different things. Practicing our computational thinking. So, I'm going to call it CP and uh, I guess that'll be that. I have simple file.txt, let's copy that. dot slash CP simple dash file to simple dash file dash copy dot txt and it ran, it got a single character at a time, and it copied it into it. Oh man, is it the same file? Beautiful. Okay, uh, let's make sure this is still still going. Now, uh, the last thing that I want to show you is an, another cool example, uh, cool set of examples maybe, uh, images. So there's a file type that's easy to read. So it's called PPM. It's very easy to read from. And uh, we'll talk about that in a second. But first, we need to understand what an image means. So you have a bunch of pixels, right? You, you've heard about those before, maybe. So every image is made up of a bunch of square, tiny pixels of a single color. the word pixel. Each color is represented as a triple of ints between 0 and 255. They mean red, green, and blue. How much red, how much green is in the color, how much blue is in the color. And uh, RGB stands for red, green, blue. It's an additive color uh, we call it an additive color uh, type. I don't know what noun should go there, but the idea is if you have green and you add blue to that and then you add red to all of that, that's all the colors together, which makes white, right? And so all the colors, 255 of all of them, so 
as much of each color equals white, and none of it, none of any of those colors, makes black. Okay, so that uh, is RGB in a nutshell. And so if you wanted red, you wanted pure red, you'd say 255, 0, 0, because you want all the red, red comes first, no green, no blue. And obviously you can combine these and create every color that's being displayed to you right now, or most of them. Uh, obviously if you had more numbers, you could represent more colors, but these are good enough for most of our purposes these days. Okay, uh, grayscale is the other last thing. If, let's pretend we have RGB, that's our, uh, this is our color that we currently have. How much red, how much green, how much blue? If they're all equal, if uh, R equals G equals B, then you have a gray. That makes gray. A shade of gray. There's 255 shades of gray. 256 shades of gray in uh, RGB. Okay, so Black is, of course, a shade of gray. White is, of course, a shade of gray. Uh, things in between, 16, 16, 16, that's gray. It's closer to black, so it's probably a dark gray. Then we have like, I don't know, 95, 95, 95. That's like in the middle, it's a light-ish gray. And then you can do whatever you want with that. So you've got any color that you want, combinations of RGB values, black and white, all of each color and none of each color, and then grayscale. Okay, now we're ready for the PPM format. It's a file type that stores images. So you give the RGB values and some extra stuff for those, and uh, like how wide, how tall the image is, as text. So here is, boop, if I go to lecture 20 in my file browser, here is a picture of my cat in the PPM format. Uh, if I do vim cat.ppm, there it is. And here is my cat with some color things around it. Here is Lonzo laying on my running shirts. So we're gonna use this file to do cool stuff. We're gonna convert it to grayscale, convert it to black and white, things like that. Okay, so uh, let's figure this out. What does this look like in pixels? So this is a, uh, the first line is always the same. It's P3, it's the name of the file type. It's like, all right, we're using PPM with RGB values. Then we give the width and height of the file. I think, I guess the width comes first because it's taller than it is longer. Uh, and then you say 255, that's the max color value. So it, everything goes between zero and 255. And then you start giving each pixel in order. Okay, so the top left pixel is gonna be this one, 38, 8, 24. Then the next one is 41, 13, 30. So it's 41 reds, 13 greens, 30 blues. And all of these together make up this picture of my cat. Because it's all text, it's very, it's not very compressed. Like if it was a JPEG, it'd be like 2.2 megs. Uh, but now it's like five megabytes, but that's okay. We don't care. So we're gonna read this file and do cool stuff. Uh, probably should have called it something else, but that's okay. So let's let's get this file. Let's get all the pixels. Uh, this is gonna be fancy. So we're gonna have to read this file in a special way uh, and write another file. So let's get the files, at least. Uh, we'll say, all right, file name. You can convert it to a string, uh, one, and then output file name. can be the next one. And so now, again, we're gonna have one IF stream, 
reading the file, the first file, with the input file name. So read the image from IFS into a few things. We need to read the width and the height so that we can preserve that. And then we need to read each pixel. Okay, so this is a very in-depth example of programming. I'm obviously not going to test you on any of this. It's just a fun example of reading files in order. So the first line is always P3, so we can skip that one. We can say, uh, we can use git line for an input stream. You can use git line, which will uh, return back uh, a new line. Okay. Okay. And I think I might have to use uh, git line ifs into a string. That one will work. Just pretend it was. like C in. Okay, so get a line, skip the first line. It's always P3. We don't care about that. The next line has the width and the height of the image, so we need to get that. Uh, so then we have a width and a height, because our cursor is now sitting right here, because we just read the first line in its entirety. Now we're sitting right there, ready to read the width and the height. Let's read those. Uh, IFS width, read the width, read the height. OK. And then uh, we're good there. Uh, break, Get to the end of the line and break it. And so uh, get to the end of the line. So finish off the line is what this will do because we only read to here, so we're still on the same line. If we get a line, we'll get to the end of it. Read nothing. Then 255 is always the same, so just skip that line as well. This is the third line. Had no useful information. And then, uh, to make it easier for us, I think I'll just delete these. And then we have a bunch of RGB values. Okay. Okay, so as long as we can now, we're going to read three RGB values. And if the file was correct, we know the size, but we can also check for things. Uh, we can say while IFS is okay to read from, perhaps, uh, or while true, or a few things. Let's start with this one at least. We'll say uh, IFS. Let's read three things at a time. Three ints. Int R, G, and B. Let's read from IFS. R, G, and B. And if the file is arranged properly, there's always going to be three things on a line. So we can confirm that as long as we can read from IFS, we should be OK. This might go bad on the last line, though. So if not IFS, break and don't do anything. OK, so we had a valid line, and we just read an RGB value. Let's do stuff with it. Let's save it. Let's save it in a vector, a vector of pixels, a vector of RGB, perhaps. Pixels dot pushback. And I'm gonna make a pixel struct. Struct RGB. It has, well, how much red? How much green? How much blue? 
pushback. This is an extended example. I know it's getting complicated, but hopefully it's making some sense. Uh, a new pixel with RGMP. And so now I've saved all the pixels in this vector. This seems to be OK for now. Uh, now we're done with IVS. Now let's do something with the pixels. Let's go through each of them. So for uh, RGB pixel in pixels, let's edit that pixel to do some cool stuff, and then we'll write back the file. OK, so the next thing I want to show you is converting one to grayscale or black and white. So when you have an RGB value, let's say it's like, I don't know, 15, 27, 85, you can make a grayscale version of a pixel by averaging all its RGB values. So I can just say, all right, what's the average value? equals 15 plus 27 plus 85 over 3. And then I just put the average three times. And suddenly we have a grayscale image, black and white. This is really cool stuff. So all right, let's change each pixel to be grayscale. Right. And OK, the way we're going to do that is find the average pixel value. Average equals the current pixels red plus the current pixels green plus the current pixels blue. All of that over 3. And so i got to go back here. Do that. And then we're going to replace those things with the average. OK, and now we just need to save that image to a new file. So we have the output file name. Let's use an OF stream now, finally. We're almost there, guys. OK, uh, then we're going to close it once we're done. Right a valid ppm image file to OFS. So remember what it means to be a valid one. You first have the line p3, then a new line. Then you have the width and the height with a space in between, and then a new line. Then you have 255, it's always that. easier that way. Uh, and then you have each pixel on a line, space separated. So uh, again, I'll copy that maybe. Oh, yes. Pixels red, space, the pixels green, space, pixels, blue, and then a new line. And that, if we didn't mess it up, converts an input image here. We read it into the pixels vector. We changed each pixel to be the grayscale version. And we're going to save it back out into a new file, hopefully in the correct format. Let's see if anything went wrong. So we're going to call this uh, images.cpp dash o images dot slash images. And we'll say cat dot ppm. And the output's going to be cat gray dot ppm. 
There it goes, doing things. Hopefully it doesn't run into an infinite loop. That would be sad. Uh, it actually completed, it just took a while. Now, I'm very curious if we did it right. I don't trust myself. Let's see if cat gray.ppm looks right. P3 with height. Ooh, this is looking good. And all of these have the same number, which means they're gray. Oh, this is going to be fun. OK, back to the file browser. So there's, here's the original cat. Boop. Oh, stay open, please. Here is the gray cat. Isn't that cool? So we read a file that was this image. We manipulated it so that it was grayscale. And we saved that file again. There's even fun, more fun things to do. You can set like a threshold and make this exactly only black or only white. That's fun to do. Uh, you can change around the color values. You could be like, all right, just swap the blues and the reds, please. See what that looks like. Uh, everything will look eerie. Uh, but have fun with this. Hopefully this is exciting enough to have you inspect this file if it didn't make too much sense uh, as I was writing it. But uh, hopefully that was fun. These are fun examples for me. OK, so now uh, that's all I wanted to say. So now let's talk about your exercises, and you'll get out of here. So one thing that you can do pretty easily is to convert cat.ppm to just black or just white. Only white pixels, or black pixels or, and white pixels. And you'll have to do that. You'll have to do that by setting a threshold based on how light the current pixel is that you're looking at. And there's a bunch of, dif there's a bunch of different ways to do that. Uh, feel free to ask me if you're interested. Uh, some other optional exercises. Write a program that keeps on getting a line from the user, and then it appends that line to a file. As long as the user keeps typing, it keeps writing that line to a file. Okay, so you have to use git line for that. And then uh, from a previous lab, you have Shakespeare.txt. Actually, from your next one, you'll have it again. Uh, read all of that, and then write a new file that is this file, but you capitalized every word in it. Okay. Those are some fun examples, I think, and uh, I think that's all I have for you. So I'll see you in your lab.